they're cycling, but not exactly. They have this recurrent behavior, right? And uh, of course, you know, whenever you know somebody asks you to try to prove something, okay, you're looking for something that can help you prove this, okay? So we're looking for a kind of theorem that says, like, look, if conditions A, B, C are met, then like something like this is true, okay? Like, so let's try to see one such theorem, okay? Right, so this is a okay, arguably one of one of the most uh, famous theorems in uh, dynamical systems and, and ergodic theory. It's called the uh, Poincaré recurrence. After Poincaré, it was actually proven in, the, uh, in 1890. Okay, so Poincaré exactly characterized which systems have this property of recurrence that now it follows his name, and he says <clears throat> you effectively need two conditions okay so the first condition is actually relatively trivial it says that it better be the case if you're trying to prove that something like cycles and goes back to itself it better be the case that your orbits are bounded otherwise if your orbits can can you know escape to infinity like game over there's nothing to prove okay the first uh, the first condition is somewhat trivial the second condition is actually rather non-trivial it says like okay um this your dynamical system, okay, now, now, if you treat it not as, a, not as a function from a point to point, okay, but you can view it as a function from a set to a set, okay? So take the set, take all of these points, map them to the respective points, and now you have the map of the set, okay? And now we want that uh, this dynamic preserves volume, okay? So for the, for the current, you know, for today's talk, when you think volume, just think of like a Lebesgue measure, okay? The standard notion of high dimensional Euclidean volume, okay? And then he says like, okay, as long as these two conditions are satisfied, then recurrence is necessary. Okay, and uh, here's a, yeah, like it's a very, very powerful theorem, okay? And it has like a very, very simple and super elegant proof, okay? The, the, the proof, the sketch of the proof is the following. Okay, so, yeah, so, well, first of all, like, why, okay, let's let's imagine we have such a map, and I take this, the set of points that correspond to this, uh, you know, joystick, whatever, and I move it forward according to the dynamic. Okay, because the dynamic preserves volume in 3D space, this thing will move to another position, let's say in this room, it says bound in, in this room, the orbits. So this is, it's, um, Shape can change, it can become like this, but its volume has to be exactly the same. Okay. So now because it's it's bounded, you cannot escape this room, or we have a, a clear upper bound on the number of, of iterations before it actually has to intersect some of its pre-images. It's the volume of the room divided by the volume of this joystick, correct? So that's the fact that it will intersect itself at some point, some pre-image is, is trivial. What is less trivial is why can it not somehow intersect in something like that falls like a, a letter rho. Okay, so it goes, 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 but it doesn't intersect where it started, which is what I would need to show that this thing is recurrent, but it just turns back into itself and say it goes here. Okay, here's the proof of, here's the genius of Poincaré. It's like, hey, <clears throat> I will prove that this is not possible. Uh, remember, we said that the system preserves volume for all possible sets. Okay, so here's my choice of set. It's going to be the union of this plus this plus this plus this plus this. One, two, three, four, five. If each of them has volume A, by volume preservation, this has volume 5A. But now this set. If you take its forward image, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. So this disappears. So 5a become 4a, impossible. So that's the proof with a little bit of, I mean, this is the proof if, if I only allow you to somehow measure volume in discrete cells, like, like a little like pixels, like a little bit of like translating this to measure theory is actually the proof. Okay, and then, uh, yeah. And the, and the fact that you have to account for like zero measure 
is exactly because of this approximation, right? Of that, that when you have like continuous space, you cannot account for zero measure sets uh, returning back themselves. Okay, so that's a proof. And, and what's really amazing, okay, about this theorem is that like you can actually see it in practice. So I will describe you a very simple actually algebraic uh, technique, a theorem that allows you to, to detect for any map if the map somehow preserves some volume. Okay, and now here, I, I um, yeah, if you think about this, uh, like what is an image? An image is a, is a bunch of numbers, you know, like let's say whatever, you have 60 by 60 pixels or something or 600 by 600, right? And then you have like for each such pixel, you have three different numbers. So RGB, okay. So this is uh, 600 by 600 times three to the R. So any picture is actually a point in this, in this uh, Euclidean space, okay. So now what I can do is I can create a transformation that takes points in the space and preserves volume staying in the space. So, the, so this space transformation it tells you like, okay, look, give me a picture, I'll give you another picture. Of course, this transformation is, is just a mathematical artifact. So it just creates garbles, garbles like mess immediately. Okay, but what does the theorem tell you? Keep iterating. At some point, you have to get arbitrarily close to where you started from. And here you can, you can visually see it. Okay, that's extremely powerful. All right, so, okay. All right, so this is the theorem. Okay, so our goal is, okay, apply the theorem. So here's the three steps. Step one, the system preserves volume. Step two, prove somehow that the vectors are bounded. Step three, uh, apply Poincare recurrence. Uh, okay, now it seems actually that, that step two is, is trivial because the trajectories, you know, the probability distributions, they're just product of simplices, everything is bounded, okay. But the way you're gonna prove this is you're gonna prove this after a change of variables. And when we do the change of variables to make this step easy, this now will become unbounded. So we have to, we have to deal with that. Okay. So yeah, okay. Uh, and here's the tools that we're gonna use. So as I said, um, this, the first part actually will be something trivial. So trivial, we'll give you a, a, another very famous, very powerful theorem, okay, from, uh, again, from dynamical systems, but uh, verifying it that, that this game theoretic dynamics, you know, preserve volume will actually not even use any math. It will, it will just follow immediately. And actually this holds for all games, not just zero sum games. So remember yesterday when I told you like, look, you cannot find any mixed mass equilibrium that is, that's an attractor. It's because this theorem holds for all games. Okay. So if the dynamics are like incompressible, then you cannot you cannot squeeze the equilibrium and, and, and make it a yeah and make it attractive. Okay. All right. So then uh, this actually will become okay. So if this holds for all games, then step two must be very special for zero sum games. Otherwise, the theorem would hold all dynamics would be cyclic. Okay. And that's the idea here is that like, uh, you know, in order to show that your energy somehow does not go to infinity, you, you show that this dynamic has some sort of like energy conservation. And uh, this energy conservation in a very somehow like fitting sense, remember the regularizer for replicator is what? Is entropy, okay. So we has to do of course, sun on entropy, information theory, right? So the invariant, would be a notion of distance that makes sense in information space. So it won't be Euclidean distance. It will actually be the Kullback uh, Kullback Leibert divergence, which a notion of like a notion of pseudo. It's a pseudo metric. It's not exactly a metric, but it's a notion of distance between distributions. Okay. So if uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So for example, if you use the Euclidean regularizer, then the distance actually here would be Euclidean distance and so on and so forth but we won't go into those details. Okay, so that's a, that's a two-step process. Okay, as I said, like, you will hear them very, 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 very nice. Um, okay, so you will exactly characterize which systems, when systems are, are locally somehow compressing themselves, 
or locally expanding or when they're like flat, when they're like volume preserving. And this actually has to do with what is known as the divergence of a vector field. So what's a vector field? As the name suggests, or well, just, a, you know, you have some, some space, right? And you assign like uh, directions of movement. So think of this like, okay, like this, like, well, how's the wind is moving, right? On every single uh, point, let's say, right? right? So this is a, so this is a function that, that has, let's say, maybe we're in 3D space. So it has like three different arguments. What's your speed in direction X, your speed direction Y, your speed direction Z, right? And this, of course, depends on all the positions in your 3D space, all right? So this is what a, is a vector field, right? And now, when you have this function, you can take this notion of derivative, but now the derivative, because it's, a, it's, a, it's not a scalar, the, the, the notion of derivative here is the Jacobian. So you take all partial derivatives, right? So you take the derivative, okay? All right, so, and what derivative of X with X, you know, all possible nine combinations, okay? But the trace, which is the sum of diagonal elements, okay, of, of this uh, Jacobian is exactly what controls whether the system expands or contracts, okay? So specifically, the system is, is, is uh, preserves volume if and only if it's divergence free. So if this quality is equal to zero, okay? Now, I don't want you just to remember this as a, automatically as a fact I told you, I actually want to try to prove this to you together in the case where the system is one dimensional, okay? Suppose that the system is one dimensional, what does it actually mean? We have only ux, right? And this is a function of x. Okay, so now great, uh, Jacobian is derivative. So what this actually means is that like, okay, ux dot of x is equal to zero. What does it actually mean? It means that your distance is always constant, right? So now what volume preservation mean? Volume in 1D is length, right? So take any interval of length L, and that's like a little train. So it moves, it stays constant, okay? Now, if you go into the, into D, like you can have like exponential somehow expansion in one direction, and this could be counteracted by exponential contraction in that direction. And that's exactly what these exponents are exactly what's being captured by these elements. So as long as these things cancel out, you're good to go. And you don't have to worry about higher terms because you're in differential equation now where everything is smooth. Okay, that's the proof. Again, fundamental theorem, but simple in its, in its, uh, in its key ideas. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna apply it and uh, it will be great because I won't even do any mathematics. It will just like follow through. Okay. <coughs> so the idea that you remember about, um, let's say FTL dynamics, which is a special case of, of the of replicator is that like, look, uh, actually, instead of keeping track of the probability distributions, the real game is happening on the on the payoff vector. So remember the or the accumulative payoff vector. So I play rock paper scissors. Uh, so I want the total payoff for playing rock so far. The total payoff for playing scissors. The total payoff for playing uh, whatever. The third strategy, and then you take the inner product minus the regularizer and do arc max. Okay. So as long as I can remember this, I can always compute my mixed strategy okay so this is what i'm going to track in my dynamical system and actually i'm going to do something more i'm going to do a little bit somehow a shift right so remember the inner product of x comma y minus the regularizer right so this does not does not change if you subtract some sort of like all one times some constant okay so that's what i'm doing here i'm taking one of the entries and I am, I am uh, somehow like removing it. Uh, and then this is actually gonna be the state space. So the state space is like, you remember for every agent, every agent keeps in mind and says like, look, I'm gonna have my benchmark strategy. It's gonna be rock. For every other strategy for paper, I'm saying like, how much money, more money have I made when I played paper versus rock? And then scissors versus rock. And this information, is, is all I need to know. It's fully informative and it's exactly what I need to know. Okay, so that's gonna be my space. Unfortunately, as I told you, this can go to minus infinity plus infinity, right? 
I play this game forever. Maybe I make a lot of gains. Okay. So, all right. But I don't care about any of these things. All I care about is com computing this quantity. And now I want you to figure out why this partial derivative have to be equal to zero. Okay, what, let's, let's read this together. What is the zi? I'm player i, I'm the row player, okay? And I'm saying like, this is total utility for playing rock minus total utility for playing paper, okay? The time derivative of this is my instantaneous utility for playing rock minus my instantaneous utility for playing scissors right now, okay? And now I'm saying like, how does this depend on infinitesimal changes of my behavior. This is the same player I. Okay. Let me do this again. So this is my utility for player I, for playing rock, okay? So this is a fun comma X minus I. So I need to know the behavior of all of the other agents, okay? Minus the utility for play i for playing scissors, x minus i. Okay. And I'm saying, like, what if you did this partial derivative, the probability of playing x i rock? It's a different thing expected things for, for some player i between two fixed sizes of his. And it's like, how does it depend on what i do? No, it's independent. If I play rock, this is just a, this is just a function. So let's do this. So we have two players, player X and player Y. The utility of player I for playing rock is just a function of Y of only your opponent's behavior, right? And this is also like just a function of only your opponent's behavior. So how does it depend on you? It doesn't depend at all. You've already made your decision. The only thing you control, you have already you have already played it. So you don't exist at all in this function. So this automatically cancels out for all games. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just a game theory. There's no algebra, there's no nothing. This is zero for all games. Okay, that's the proof. Where would you use the FTR? Sorry? Where did you use the FTRL? So, so the FTRL is used right, on the fact that uh, yeah, on the formula uh, that you could imagine, okay, that's a great question. So think of uh, if you do optimism, right? So optimism actually, like what you play could actually affect you, right? Like, uh, so if you have like trends somehow, right? So this could affect if the dynamics are like volume, volume compressing or volume uh, shrinking, okay? So that's, that's the thing, yeah. So, so since any momentum. Exactly, yes, exactly, exactly. And that's what we never get actually. Sometimes we do want to make the dynamics volume shrinking. And actually, actually we will prove this. So you can actually formally prove that optimism is not volume shrinking, okay? So that's another way of arguing about the stability. Okay, actually we'll get, we'll get this, but uh, this has to do with discretization techniques. Okay, so we're done uh, with step one. Step two, okay, trajectories are bounded. Um, trajectories are bounded, okay. So, okay, I will tell you this, okay. Okay, this is not easy to see, but suppose, uh, yeah. But if somebody gave you this, Right, so if somebody tell you, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to I'm going to be God. And I'm going to be kind to you, and the way you, somehow you're trying to imagine a Lyapunov function, I'm going to give you this function and tell you this, this is this remains constant for all time. Okay, then using this this condition, you can actually prove that these y's cannot go to plus or minus infinity, because uh, if you meaning if the if your kill divergence is constant. It means that you remain, you may, you stay bounded from the boundary. If uh, this is a fully mixed strategy, if you go towards the boundary with this point, then this goes to infinity. So the fact that this is constant for the summation of these positive quantities are constant 
we may see means that both players will stay bound away from the boundary. And this implies in the in the Z space that you stay you stay bounded. Okay, so that's it. Of course, you have to. I mean, sometimes that's the, a little bit of the thing that you have to try to uh, be lucky in some sense and uh, find something that, that can allow you to control the space. And as I said, this only holds for zero sum games. It's very, very special. Okay, so and in the case of FTL dynamics, effectively, if you have some version of Bergman divergence, so I want to go into the details, but some, some reasonable generalization of this notion for different type of regularizers. Okay, so that's it. So turning okay. in the previous slide, I'm, I'm still a bit confused. Yes. The zero derivation on the board. Mm -hmm. You had the, the derivative with respect to your choice X, the probability. Yeah, okay, so here- you have the derivative with respect to the payoffs. Hmm? Over here, you have the derivative with respect to the payoffs. Yeah, okay, so here, I, I just made the argument in the probability space. So here, you actually do it in the, in the payoff space, but it doesn't really matter. The main thing is like, as long as this depends on I, right? Then this, you have no control over this difference. See that, you see what I'm saying? So this, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between these variables and X. Okay, so in some sense, it's, a, it's another equivalent way of, of representing that information. But I'm saying this information is totally irrelevant for this point. But then why did you not do it in that space? Like what, why? Uh, just because, yeah, because it was not clear for somebody that, uh, like, I think Grant had the discussion, like, oh, yeah, why? I think it's I think it's easier to see in this space that here this depends on why, right? And then I think the argument... No, but I'm saying why in, on the slide you have it? In, what is more convenient to do it in this space? Uh, because it's actually not true in the other space. So, like, you have to... Okay. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so the arguments here, remember... So the, right, okay. So in this space, we are in Rn, okay? So your will theorem works in Rn. If you work on a subspace, then you have to be much more careful what, what you mean by volume, okay? Okay, so you have to have like a more complex notion of a volume form. And this, this change of variables actually simplifies the analysis. You could still do it in the original space, but then as I said, like, it's more pedantic to define what the volume means. Yeah, thanks. That's actually a good question. Uh, okay. All right. So, and then, okay, the main thing is that, like I said, the fun thing is the simulation. So, you know, you've proven all these things and now you just sit back and you say, like, okay, let's test the power of the theorem. All right. So, here's this uh, uh, the transformed space. Remember, the transform, this is like matching pennies. So the transform spaces for the X player, how much more have I gotten for playing rock versus playing, uh, for playing heads versus tails? So if he's at zero, I'm, I'm gonna output 50-50. Okay, and this is the Nash equilibrium. So if you have exactly the same payoffs historically, you're gonna output 50. So this is the Nash. Okay, and this is somehow like, okay, look, uh, like, you know, I've, I've gotten more, more money for playing heads, more money for playing tails for the other person, whatever. Okay, so now I'm gonna say like, we're gonna move this forward. And this should preserve volume, okay? And in some sense, okay, it, of course it does. Uh, but the interesting thing is that like, okay, you have this deformation. So it's not like that, uh, so the set gets spaghettified as it's actually being, being uh, uh, somehow moved around. And the reason for this actually, this, the behavior of this game is very, very simple because, because it's just two dimensional. In two dimensional space, effectively, all the only allowable kind of behaviors are periodicity. So, what happens is like uh, here, there's a bunch of periodic orbits around the Nash equilibrium for every possible different level sets. But now the things that they have different speeds, okay, locally. So, as a result, like things get gets deformed uh, over time and, and you get more and more like stretched out. It actually goes for a little while. So, maybe we can wait. So. So in some sense, if you wait for long enough, this would just like somehow create an infinitely thin dense like string that somehow like covers the whole range of allowable uh, energy levels, okay? But again, as you see, you stay bound away from the boundary, which is the first guarantee, and nothing escapes infinity, okay? 
So if you see that and you buy that, okay, at this point, that this thing preserves volume, then you have recurrence. And uh, okay, you say like, look, I don't really believe that this thing preserves volume. You can actually go all the way and uh, mechanically use, you know, some Voronoi diagram approximation to actually compute the volume. So this is, again, a different visualization. So this is the level sets. So different colors uh, correspond to yeah, different energy. So every point stays on the same color here. But remember, you started, you started with just this square. Okay, so everything's like this perfect uh, geometry. But it just gets, again, deformed. But as you see, the, in the KL sense, it just moves forward and backward. So points do not actually change, change their energy. And as I said, like, this is really about this. Like, look, you can actually, you can actually test the, the theorems to their full extent. Okay. And that's it. Okay. So there in the figure, the volume was increasing. Which figure? Your volume seems to be. So this, okay. So this, I mean. Or is it, oh, it's the, that, okay. Yes, this, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, like, for a moment, I thought like, wow, like, like, like Vasilis really has like immense supervision <laughs> here. Like, uh, you know, uh, yeah. No, I think this is like, uh, I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, there are always some numerical issues with any approximation, right? But, but no, I think this is uh, as good as it gets. All right. So then the other things are like, okay, once you have like energy preservations, like, you know, and, and you, you have some background in physics, things start like twinkling. You say like, oh, look, uh, you know, the most famous class of energy preserving systems are something called the Hamiltonian. Okay, which are, I mean, okay, this standard, uh, somehow like systems where we have like position and momentum pair, these are like dual variables. And you have this set of equations that immediately imply that this function is being preserved. Well, there is a way to reformulate the system somehow in a way that you actually make it a formal Hamiltonian. Okay, and uh, in some sense, the, the Hamiltonians like, uh, you know, the convex conjugates, which is something coming from convex analysis, the thing that's all like that, that becomes your, your energy. Uh, yeah, and, and this is something that was, that was explored before, uh, all the way back from 96, but these arguments actually extend to more general uh, regularizers. Okay, so yeah, so there's something deep about the connection with physics is not just uh, at the base level, okay? And now it's like, okay, and now actually we're done with, we're done with, uh, with continuous time. Uh, how am I doing with time? The, okay, okay, good, good. With, uh, okay, so this is the real discrete time. Okay, and now we're gonna think about discretization, but is, are there any questions about the continuous time uh, analysis? Yes? Would the volume necessarily have to be stable if the space in which the probability density set was also changing? related to the volume so that the space grew in a direct proportion to the volume so that your setting actually oscillates so here okay i haven't talked about at all actually about probability density right so here like uh everything's actually a set right now you could you could do what you're saying and so like we have done that but like it's not related to the client so <clears throat> i'm trouble pulling the last slide like um uh -huh. but so when yeah uh, like what yeah, what is the point? Like, what, where does it okay, go great, to great, great, great. Okay. that this is a Hamiltonian? All right, all right, yes, 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 okay. So this idea is about like, classes um, of uh, dynamics is falling. Okay, great, great. That's a, that's a very valid question. Okay. So the thing about, uh, yeah, the thing about Hamiltonian systems is that like that from the perspective of dynamic systems theory, they have, they have uh, somehow attracted much, much more attention than any random class of dynamic systems. Okay, so if you can reformulate the system as a Hamiltonian, so maybe there's extra tools you can also like get for free. So it's like, okay, the theme says, like, okay, for any system, if your Hamiltonian has this property, then this actually holds. holds. So then all you have to do is like testing, okay? Like, oh, is this property true in this system? Okay, so that's like, that's generally like a, like a, like a valuable property, and this actually is something we would leverage uh, in, in this discretization approach. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so for example, yes. So let me tell you this. Okay. So so okay. Hamiltonians is really somehow like a planetary orbits, planetary mechanics. Okay. So people have have spent insane amount of energy. Actually, like their understanding was developed to be able to predict accurately the orbit motion. Okay. So people have developed, you know, insane many many different discretizations with very very high accuracy. So I said, okay, let's just let's just use those. Right. So that's simulating the system. Correct. Yes. But is it but is it uh, desirable, not from the perspective of analysis, but from the perspective of like the dynamics itself, that that the, the, the dynamic behavior in a game should have a Hamiltonian, or maybe it's better if it doesn't and it converges to a, or I don't know, like you know. Yeah, I mean that's, is that's, it, uh, mm -hmm. you don't care about analysis, but right, that's, right, that's, right. Uh, so yeah, so here I mean uh, when it comes to this kind of questions, I'm like totally agnostic. So like my question is like okay look if I see a behavior a system it's kind of like recurrent then okay whatever I mean first of all don't feel like neither positive or negative about this it's just how the system behaves but now you can say like look like Hamiltonian systems are recurrent is this truly like somehow is there some connection over there or is it like just another random system that recycles with no return okay thank you all right. Um, all right. So now we're actually going to discrete time. And you can tell this because now the orbits are no longer smooth. They just become as this, this dotted points. And we're going to start, of course, with uh, multiplicative rate updates. And uh, so, in, and in this case, now remember the k divergence. The k divergence was what was constant. That was your invariant function, right? Okay? Uh, but the reason why it was constant because in in continuous time you can you can disregard second order effects, okay? But in, in, in uh, continuous time, in discrete time, you cannot do it anymore, okay? But because like your orbits are effectively convex, your second order errors, like they always have like a reliable sign, they, they move away, okay? So you're always moving away. And the question is like, okay, what happens to these errors as they aggregate? If the sum of the squares of the errors goes to infinity, then you kill the person which is infinity and you convert the boundary. And that is this case. Okay. Whereas somehow, if this is this is something finite, then you convert to some limit behavior, okay, which is like a level set of the replicator. But what is pretty interesting is like how in some sense unpredict unpredictable the statistics of the behavior of the system is, right? You could say, like, look. All I know is that like, you know, at some point, some level set, maybe all the way to the boundary or maybe anywhere in between will be stabilized. And then the statistics will be some distribution over this level set, okay? So actually zero sum games from a statistics perspective have a huge somehow like variety of possible behaviors that you can actually see, right? It's not just a direct distribution at the equilibrium, okay? And even if you, now if you change somehow the regularizer, you change the geometry of these circles. So this is not a Euclidean circle, it's a KL ball. Okay, changing the regularizer would just uh, yeah, affect how this actually looks. So you have like all of these different, uh, yeah, all of these different phenomena like emerging. And uh, <coughs> yeah, and now going slowly to, oh yeah, and now we can ask the, all, the other behavior. Okay, what happens to volume preservation? Once again, second order effects a real thing, and now it's actually volume expansion. So it's not just that if I take an infinitesimal ball out of the NASA equilibrium, that only this ball expands, is it like, no, 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 you have expansion everywhere. Okay. So you have this kind of like unpredictability, right? Some small perturbation would actually uh, have this like large long term effects, like, uh, yeah, what's Colloquially called the uh, called the butterfly effect, and uh, yeah, so this is an example of of such a behavior. So like somehow like this is your initial set. It's like the small uh, set, and then you know you like every iteration is like maybe like a thousand steps or whatever. And then you see like somehow like you have both the rotation that comes from the first order approximation, the rotation of the replicator, but also like an expansion. Okay, that creates this called like a tornado tornado looking kind of effect 
So we, we've called this the, the von Neumann vortex. So yeah, it's kind of, I think it's kind of cute as a, as a behavior. And uh, actually, okay. So, so far I've only talked about uh, deterministic dynamical systems. And indeed like once you, once you start randomness, things will become like much harder. Um, but at least for the case of uh, stochastic MWU, you can actually analyze what happens. And uh, what you have is that the statistical behavior actually concentrates only on pure strategy outcomes. So, okay, I mean, this is, uh, yeah. So this is actually a probability distribution here, right? So you start, let's say, with a, with a Dirac measure with probability one, I'm starting here. But now every time you actually see an update rule, you see, the update rule happens because everybody actually threw the random coins and say like, oh, now I'm gonna play heads. I'm gonna play tails, okay? So every day, let's say in rock, paper, scissors, you have nine different outcomes. So the probability splits nine ways, okay? How it splits depends on the kind of probability distribution, right? But you see like eventually, where you end up spending most of your time or where the their probability mass is concentrated to the actual corners, which once again, is like very far away from what you would expect from the statistic, from, from the Dirac at the center, you know, which is the, the Nash equilibrium uh, in the case of zero sum games. Okay, and now here's like an interesting question. Okay, what if I'm gonna get in the game of like uh, keeping this kitten alive here? Like this is not Schrodinger's kitten. This is a, uh, you know, Georgia's kitten or whatever. And it's like, I don't want it to be deformed or at least it can be deformed, but like at least I want its volume to stay constant. Uh, can, I, can I somehow like do that? And yeah, and then uh, can actually, you can actually develop a, a discretized method that does this. And actually uh, like Vasily, this is where connections to Hamiltonians come into play. So uh, in this paper, we're actually uh, proven that this uh, alternating gradient descent. So like I play, you play, I play, you play. Okay, so, so this has uh, this recurrent property and it has actually a bunch of other very nice properties. Okay, uh, actually this, uh, okay. Importantly, this theorem only holds for the case of unconstrained uh, bilinear games. Okay, so here there's no simplex. Okay, and this is an important simplification. If you add simplex, like all of these theorems will actually collapse, okay? But as long as you're willing to say like, okay, look, this is like, you know, when something feels more like machine learning, learning inspired, okay? Then you have all of these properties. You have taken the properties of replicator of the continuous time, okay? But, uh, right. So, and, and the other thing that's actually interesting <coughs> is, uh, I think somebody asked me about this. They're like, okay, now, you have a different notion that's be, of energy that's being preserved. So in the case of continuous time, the, for, for gradient descent, the energy is actually the, the radius, okay? Here, it's more like an ellipsoid. Like this, there is an error term that you have to add, okay? On this, on your original energy function. But once you add it, then you can actually prove, show that this slightly perturbed energy is, is uh, preserved. But that's fine because this is guarantees to show you that, that uh, you cannot go to infinity. And then you can, you can proceed with, uh, with the proof uh, La Poincare. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. And then, okay, I, I will, I will, I'll just touch upon this because uh, Kosti did a great job uh, explaining about all of these uh, results about optimistic and, and uh, variance. Of course, like, so I work here with uh, Vasilis. Of course, there's been this is like kind of like really, really uh, old by now. There's a lot of like uh, very exciting recent work. Okay, but there's another way of interpreting this. As I said, is that like, look, uh, actually optimism is volume shrinking. Okay, but here's the interesting thing. This doesn't come for free. Optimism is volume shrinking in zero sum games. But if you flip the utility, the sign of the second agent, it becomes expanding. So it's kind of like, okay, like there's no free lunch theorem. Okay, if you don't have, it would be great to say like, okay, look, I, I can optimize all NAS, okay. And uh, you know, at least optimism does not do it. I mean, it's not clear that any, any algorithm actually does it. We know that, you know, as I said yesterday, FTRL cannot, cannot uh, 
cannot make anything attractive, right? It's it's it cannot it cannot create a anti Nash equilibrium. So this is yeah. So this is something like that's really 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 open outside the special but very important case of of zero sum games. Okay, and of course I should point out that there's a lot of very exciting work in this from the space of like you know zero sum games which are like non convex concave. But then again, you know, because this did an excellent job expanding upon these results. So uh, so here we won't we won't be exploring those. Yes. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So here the results actually are in discrete time. Yeah, this is in discrete time. It is, and that that is in our paper. It's a it's a stepping stone in the proof. Okay, but I don't want to go, I don't want to go in that in that direction right now. But yes, if you're in this question, yeah, please uh, check out this uh, paper with uh, Marco. Okay, so so I mean, here's like my my one short one slide summary of everything that we've learned so far. Okay, look, in the case of zero sum games, like continuous dynamics just behave as pendulums. Okay, and maybe I'm gonna say like, okay, uh, I mean, this is interesting. I don't know if the, if idealized is the correct word. I'm saying like, let's say, okay, whatever. Like, uh, I don't feel good or bad about it. That's the state of the world. For whatever reason, continuous time dynamics lead to cycles in quotes, Poincare recurrence uh, more accurately, okay? But if you, if you understand that, then you should not be surprised that discretization controls everything, okay? If you have a system that's just like on the verge of like not going away or going close, okay? Then any second order control on the system will totally detect its behavior, okay? So if you're not careful, you get instability and chaos by just a natural oily discretization if you do more and more somehow this uh, optimistic ideas where you say like, oh, okay, don't go here, go into the future. So get a gradient here and just apply it here. And now you're moving the interior. And then if you do some more like alternating method, then you, okay, this is horrible. Okay. Uh, so alternating method does something effect like this. So you don't, you, you're not exactly on the cycle, but you stay close enough. All right, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's it. I mean, that's the the case of of uh, zero sum games. Any 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 questions about uh, about the statements? Okay, so I I have promised the to give you a definition of chaos, and then we will we will finish with this, uh, and then we'll finish with some some that I consider to be kind of interesting and. Uh, and somewhat surprising is it like, okay, look, um, the, as I said, like conditions and potential games are the paragon of, of stability and good behavior for learning dynamics. Okay, so like, okay, look, learning dynamics actually converts to equilibria in those cases and, uh, uh, and in most natural cases, okay? But here we're gonna be very somehow like, uh, like nasty theoreticians and you're gonna be thinking like, like, uh, like you know, like, like I'm, hmm, like I'm BP and I'm trying to destroy the climate. Like how much do I need to push the system in a very somehow like unnatural direction before the system actually breaks? It performs a bifurcation and it exhibits new kinds of behaviors, okay? And then the question is like, you know, what type of behaviors do you, do you see? And then, uh, yeah, and how, okay? And the type of effectively uh, phase transitions that we'll try to explore is like, what happens for a very specific model of increasing the agent's behavior. Okay. So can you like keep adding, 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 adding more, more agents to the system? And then at what point uh, in our specific model, you know, the system just now says, oh, I can't deal with this. And the dynamics like uh, run, run uh, amok. Okay, so again, congestion games, I think we've seen this uh, yesterday. So again, I will be using like a very, very simple <coughs> example for anything I will be talking today. But I said like, okay, here's what we more or less know. As I said, like, look, if you run multiplicative weight updates or any other reasonable dynamic and your, step, and, and your learning rate is, not, is, is small enough, then the systems are gradient-like, okay? And we know this. Actually, don't, they don't just converge to equilibria, but by using some sort of like a more advanced technology of center stable manifold theorem, you can actually show that they converge to pure Nash. But the question here is that like we say like, look, uh, Let's really increase epsilon, okay? Uh, this is not a good idea, okay? 
definitely for multiplicative weights, it's not a good idea. But let's say for other dynamics, like maybe clairvoyant dynamics, it is a good idea. So maybe you can say like, okay, look, let's let's try to run this experiment and then uh, try to see maybe we get lucky. Maybe we get epsilon to infinity and we see like something really create good. It won't happen, but uh, it's still kind of like fun to play around with. Okay, and the question is like, you know, there's two questions here. Is it like, okay, is the system robust or you have uh, this phase transitions, this, okay. And uh, yeah, so let's see what happens. Okay, and then here's something that's actually kind of interesting. Is it like, okay, multiplicative weight updates, okay, has many, many different variants. And here's like two very well-known ones. So this is like the standard approach that comes from the, from the K, uh, K, KKT conditions of the, of the, of the regularizer. But like many times people actually say like, okay, look, let's, let's use this linearized version when epsilon is, is uh, small enough, like, oh, you know, these are effectively equivalent, okay. Uh, so when we say like, okay, uh, and we'll play around with the simplest possible congestion game, just two players, two bins, okay? Just to keep everything like super simple to simulate, all right? So what happens? Okay, so here's the, here's the statements, okay? In this linear, <laughs> in this linear version, you have the most convert, the most robust result you ever hope to prove. So for any congestion game, no matter the number of players, no matter like, uh, you know, number of strategies, and for any epsilon learning rates, okay, as long as, of course, these things remain positive, okay, cannot be good, uh, then this dynamic will always converge to Nash equilibrium, okay, which is what we want. So like, this is really, really great. Uh, what about, you know, the other guy, which is actually in some sense the, the original version, then uh, things are actually very bad. Uh, so even the simplest possible two balls to beans case, like uh, there are simple examples that lead to limit cycles and uh, lead your cares. And in the next slide, okay, okay. Uh, in the next slide, I will give a formal definition for uh, for what these two words mean, and specifically lead your care. But is there any question about what what is the statement of, of this theorem? So this always converges to NAS. This is just something really weird that we'll see in the, in the next slide. Okay. So, okay, so limit cycle is something that like, you know, it just, it's what you would think. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a cycle, that's a limit that you have some initial conditions that converge to. Okay, so that's, that's not too exciting of a definition, uh, but this is exciting and, and it's worth taking, uh, taking a stab at this. Actually, this is the first, formal definition of chaos in, in, in mathematical literature. Okay. Uh, yeah, it comes from a very seminal paper by Lee New York. And okay, so to describe this, let's describe what's a scrambled set. Okay. So given a dynamical system with an update rule, okay, F, uh, a pair of points, two points are called scrambled. If the trajectories get arbitrarily close, so they get super close, okay. But then always move apart again. So this is like, okay, here's these two points. Move, 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 they get very, very close. And then they go apart again and get very, very close and then apart. But their distance, when I say they get close, they get infinitely close if you're willing to wait long enough, but they never actually collapse into, they don't like say, okay, from this point on, we'll just join. No, they always somehow like separate again. It's like a couple that like cannot make a decision. We really love each other and then we share each other. <laughs> nice analogy. Eh? Mm -hmm. Just came up with it. I feel really proud. Okay, I'm gonna use it again. All right, so, okay, so this is the definition of a scrambled set. And then I'm saying, oh, of a scrambled pair. A scrambled set is like, a, is, a, is a set of points such that any such pair of points has this property. Okay, so like, okay, now you think, if you think about some perspective of, of computation, like you cannot actually tell any of these two, any, any such orbit in the set apart. Because at some point, they will get within your computer accuracy. And then your computer will spit out something and you don't know what you're seeing. Okay, so all of these points are effectively indistinguishable for any computational, any reasonable computational model because this limit is equal to zero. Okay, so they will become indistinguishable at some point. Okay, so here's the definition of linear chaos. A discrete time, this is discrete time. A discrete time dynamical system is called linear chaotic if it has periodic orbits for all possible periods. So not just period one, which is equilibrium, but period two, period three, 
period, you know, a million and eleven, all of them. Okay. And there is an uncountably infinite large set that is scrambled. Okay. Yes. Right, it has, I thought if it has period three, then it has. Uh, you gave it away. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. So you're you're going to give the theorem. Okay. So so now this is just the definition of the behavior. Okay. But that's that's fine. It's coming. So like uh, okay. Like, but let's let's go. Let me just jump to the theorem because this is like totally crazy. Okay. So this is what is uh, again. This is like one of the most seminal papers, like uh, in dynamic system theory. Uh, Linger proved that as long as your dynamical system is one dimensional, so the simplest possible discrete time system, okay, there's one degree of freedom, as long as your orbit, as long as there's a single orbit that's actually periodic of period three, then it's linear chaotic. So here this feels like this theorem feels so asymmetric, right? So it's like, okay, just, just give me one period three. Which I could do this in high school, you know. You do this with like just you know intermediate, like you know, like case analysis. Like I give you a function f. Find me if this okay. This is my function f in blue. Okay. All right. So when f intersects x equals y, that's an equilibrium. Okay, and I'm saying like, okay, compute f squared, which is this function. Okay. Now compute f cube, which is this function. If this f cube intersects the green line at a point other than this then that's part of a period three orbit so this system once you iterate this is going to be linear chaotic so it's going to have periodic orbits of all possible periods and you know the other good stuff or bad stuff okay so all right so that's the idea the idea here is like okay that that uh i mean you can you can sort of like visually I mean, the fact that that, uh, as 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 we did in the previous example, <coughs> if you want to find like a single example of something that's linear chaotic, it's almost like you know high school algebra to verify this. Just 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 find such a such a such a case. Okay, so that's what we we did in this in, in initial paper uh, with Yanis. Okay, and then uh, there we had like a single example. Okay, and we say like, look, this. I mean, I think where was this example? This is the example. This exact example, like is linear chaotic. Okay. And then of course you can say, like, okay, look, it's just, is there something magical about like 1.4? And uh, the answer is that like uh, not only there's nothing magical about 1.4, but effectively, okay. The only way you cannot have chaos in this simple example, if the cosines are exactly x and x. If the game is symmetric, if so, if, if your equilibrium is 50 50, it's only that game that's not going to become chaotic. Okay. Anything else, as you increase the step size, will probably become chaotic. Okay. Yes. If you perturb the symmetric game, it becomes asymmetric, so, the, so you get care. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and again, uh, this this theorems can also be applied. Okay, so in, in the previous model we just had like uh, effectively two agents, and instability was happening by increasing the step size. Like a mathematically equivalent model is to have a, a non-atomic population. Okay, and then you keep increasing somehow like the total mass on the system. Okay, so this is. So from the perspective of, of the multiplier weight updates map, it's like increasing the map is like increasing the epsilon, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then, as I said, you get chaos, and effectively you get chaos for all games. So, so once you prove chaos for like two games, you can prove it for larger networks by kind of like a, uh, not inductive kind of argument, but like, you know, a complexity kind of like result. Okay, okay, here's something actually that's actually kind of crazy, okay? So, okay, so again, it's chaotic, the system's chaotic. So let's say I have a large population of users and then I cannot tell you, oh, this is the, the occupancies. So in, in the case of periodicity, like all days you're here, 20% use the top link. And then even days you lose like, you know, 80 and that's back and forth, back and forth. Okay, here's a chaotic system, okay. So here, like the occupancy is like totally unpredictable, okay. But here's the funny thing. 
in time average, okay, the occupancy of each link is exactly the equilibrium cost. Okay. So in some sense, despite the system being like totally unpredictable, if there's somebody who, who observes the statistics and say like, look, I'm going to try to see like how many, how many people, how much, what percentage of the population uses the top link. Okay, it will be exactly what the equilibrium uh, analysis suggests. Okay, so chaos implements equilibrium in a, in a weird sense. Uh, yes, in a weird sense. Okay, uh, and then there's another thing that's actually kind of cool. Uh, yeah, maybe forget about these graphs, but just look here. So this is the system, this is time, and this is the equilibrium level set. So when the population is, is small, then very quickly you convert to equilibrium. But as you keep increasing, you have a bifurcation and you go from period one to period two. Now you have like a limit cycle of period two. Now it goes from period two to period four to period eight. And you have like uh, this period doubling out the cares. So the, the phase transitions become shorter and shorter. Okay. And within a, a finite number of population increase, you get to chaos. Okay. But this, uh, this period doubling around to chaos is something that has been uh, observed uh, in other kind of like dynamical systems that have to do with the logistic equation. Multiplicative beta bits is not in the, in the family of dynamics, but it actually does exhibit this kind of behavior. Okay. And I'm going to finish with this. Okay, to get things even more weird. Okay, so this is something that, like, I, I actually did not believe that somehow it was possible. And then I was like very frustrated that it is possible and actually provably so. Okay, here's a game, okay, that has a unique equilibrium. This unique equilibrium is locally attracting, okay, and the system is still chaotic. All right, so, like, if I was an economist and somebody told me, okay, like, okay, oh, no, no, forget economist. I'm a guns person, okay, aspiring guns person. And I'm saying like, look, I have a gun architecture. I have proven somehow magically that it has a unique equilibrium, okay. And furthermore, like I have proven that this is like locally attracting. At that point, like, you know, like this is an amazing paper. Like we should go and run, run with it. Like, and I'm saying like, okay, look, like this is not an artificial game. This is like a congestion game. It's something that, like one of the, the most natural class of games, okay? And we can create this kind of behavior, unique equilibrium, locally attracting, and chaos, formal chaos. Not experimentally, provably, okay? So local, local stability, yeah, it comes with an asterisk, okay? And uh, interesting enough, okay, so this is shown for follow the regularized leader. So we, uh, so this kind of behavior actually is not possible with multiplicative weight updates. Like provably it's not possible. So this actually shows, it's the first example we see like, well, actually look, the regularizer, which somehow like feels, okay, this is like, okay, whatever. Some mathematical detail actually affects the behavior of the system in a very somehow like non-trivial uh, non way. Okay. So yeah. So there's a lot of things that we don't understand. Yeah, and there's the question, okay, right. I've talked only about, only about zero sum games and potential games. And then there's a reason about this is because like once we go beyond this, like things become very, yeah, less clear. The only thing that I had is that what I told you yesterday is that like, look, um, yeah, that, that, that uh, you cannot stabilize mixed mass. Okay. So it doesn't matter if you play around with the regularizer, like uh, as long as the equilibrium is not strict, then they cannot become, and then you have this, this volume preservation argument that, that uh, comes into play. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, okay, it's, it's, uh, it's quite an active area. And uh, yeah, and I'm saying like, okay, yeah, I was discussing this uh, uh, also with Vasilis, like, you know, and I, I, I don't mean I look like, like these kind of questions here should feel like that they, they are adversarial to our, our exploration in machine learning or AI. I think they're very like uh, synergistic, okay? So I'm saying like, look, they, we should like cross fertilize ideas. So how do we, you know, take some of these findings that say in, in normal from games and like maybe inspire like algorithms for more complex settings of games that are like relevant to AI and also like vice versa, you know, 
what kind of like insights and ideas from AI can actually help us, uh, you know, with, with our with our goals in machine learning. Uh, and I think I'm I'm pretty much done actually. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? I guess I have kind of a conceptual question, which is how are you thinking of dynamics? Are we thinking of them as ways to analyze games? Are we thinking of them as behavioral patterns of agents to kind of figure out? Is there another way that we should be thinking about them? Mm. Okay, that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking the dynamics, and, and this also has to do with how I'm trying to evolve my almost visualization skills. Like I, I, I like to be able to understand like almost like an evolving society, okay? And uh, the dynamics actually are points in belief space of these societies. And I'm trying to understand like how these things could actually like evolve. And there's some very interesting questions here that, that, that I think are, are, are emerging, you know, like uh, in terms of even, uh, you know, representation, like uh, the different sorts of randomness, you know, as I said, like, uh, you know, ideas like, like entropy comes into play and so on and so forth. So, yeah. So I think that's my, that's my way of thinking, I would say, but, uh, but I think, that, uh, yeah, different kind of interpretations, uh, you know, be very valid and very useful. And I would say like one thing that's actually a very non-trivial problem, and sometimes it has been cracks in like, in the theoretical results are visualizations. Like in some sense, like um, many times the real breakthrough is not any sort of like mathematical technicality, but what's the correct space? Like what's the correct space where you actually study dynamics? Somehow it's like, like you know, if you want to go the, the route of the Hamiltonians, like um, why somehow is position and momentum the correct variables? Well, they are, you know, if somebody gives you this, you're like, you're like halfway, more than halfway done with the problem, okay. So yeah, so so yeah, so uh, that's an interesting idea. And it's a very interesting question actually for things like guns. So I think like there where like you really have the the representation competition really really explodes, and you cannot hope by any way to represent everything. There is very interesting questions like what you should put out there, right? You know, I mean something like okay, like like the kind of graphs that 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 you know we we produce is like look. Here's error, error goes down, you know, or like, you know, here's performance, performance goes up. Okay. And of course, okay. But I think we, and, and I'm not saying this is like all super valid import benchmarks, okay. But I think it's also like, you know, but I think there are probably other things to, to point out there that, that uh, can identify useful structure. Okay. And, and, uh, and I think that's an interesting question to think about. All right. So, like, one of the reasons, for example, GANS has been like, so successful, I would say, as a, as a, as an architecture, because you can put, plot, plot out the face, and say, okay, look, I can understand parameters, but human mind recognizes faces and say, like, oh my god, that's amazing. Okay, that's a really good looking face. Like, let's give this my this guys more money, more energy, more. So it has really made like a huge impact. Okay, uh, but now you know this idea is actually kind of petering out. Like the face are already looking perfect. Okay. Maybe this is a new kind of like uh, visualization space that, that, that could be interesting and promising. Maybe something to think about. Mm -hmm. My question about your chaos results is uh, you Sorry, wanted which was that? the chaos results. Uh, okay. You wanted the samples, the population size to grow. Uh -huh. If you're in situations that many times arise in AI where you have like some fixed population, or like to, you know, like in, in, in Gans, as you were saying, two agents. Do you still believe that you no. get this? Great question. Okay, yeah, sure. So like, let me tell you, uh, uh, so Gans, you have the kind of chaos that has more has to do with like volume presentation, because like the lapoon of chaos and not, not this kind of like, uh, yeah. So I don't think this, this, I don't necessarily see this as a threat for AI systems. Actually, to be honest, like this really comes from, from a, a genuine philosophical interest to me about the state of the world. So population is increasing, okay? And there are systems out there, like, you know, traffic systems, hospitals, who are actually, you know, they're, they're, you cannot create 
you know, physical resources copies quickly. It's not like servers, you know. So somehow, like, okay, there's a real question. So like, okay, do we really believe that these things will keep working well with people just being like self-motivated and trying to find their own thing? And if not, then maybe at some point you actually need a centralized authority. It's like, look, you cannot go to any hospital you want. I control where you go. Okay, and that's that's a very that's a very somehow like difficult decision for many different kinds of societies. We see like people like really value their freedom in terms of like doing whatever you want. So I think one question that actually I have is that like, and, and I'm really pursuing this is that like, okay, these are like really simplified toy models. Okay, can we make? Okay, I'm always trying to think about like my understanding as as a kind of like set of like nesting dolls. Okay, so there's a there's a <clears throat> The result about convergence to mass, which I really love, of course, I've done a lot of work in that area. And I said like, okay, I removed the nesting doll. And underneath it, now I have a set of conditions where it get chaotic. Well, is there a, like, what's the next ne nesting doll? What's the phase transition that would make my chaotic result going back to convergence? Okay. So maybe this is something that's like, that's currently, let's say, uh, uh, let's say uh, un uh, unmodeled. And let me tell you actually, what I'm looking at right now, okay. So, uh, what if, okay, you actually create like an infinite dimension measure that actually encodes a diversity of beliefs of the whole population? So you know, there are some people who, who right now they wake up and say like, look, I'm going to go to the first part of probability twenty percent. Then after say twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, the whole realigns from zero to one. So now the whole society is just like waveform. Now this waveform gets updated. It's not just a single point, right? It's a whole function. And I usually like, okay, like, so the, so the current model is a Dirac. You see like, look, everybody thinks uniformly. We wake up, we have the same beliefs, we update and so on and so forth. Clear, artificial, but it's a starting point. Now you can say like, okay, what if I don't do that? What if like, no, I allow through diversity of beliefs and maybe, for example, I allow like uh, every, you know, a similar distribution over the set of step sizes. So like, you know, you have step sizes from zero to a hundred. Now you have a fixed distribution there, you know? And then maybe I have another distribution of a regularizer, okay? Now this looks like something that like, that feels like, look, okay, this is closer to a real society. Could it be the case that like, okay, the system has like better, you know, in, in that space of systems, actually equilibration is typical. And this Dirac example was just something like an artificial simplicity. Okay. Unfortunately, and I kind of like mean this, it seems that this is not the case. Like the, our preliminary understanding of this uh, seems to suggest that like chaos is actually robust, even in this infinite dimensional case. But maybe there's a deeper nesting doll, you know? So, like, uh, but I think, uh, yeah, but I think especially in problems that we really try to model something that we really feel exists out there, like we should really be trying to push. Like, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not looking at this to say like, okay, this is something that happens in the real world. Right now, everything's kind of like a mathematical curiosity. I'm saying like, okay, look, how much do I believe in this? Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, so there's gonna be two hour break and then uh, Nika mm -hmm. will start her tutorial on learning and the principles of strategic behavior. Um, see you then.